Okay, good day everyone. Welcome to the Ace3 Africa DNA Day webinar. Um, my name is Ebony Madden. I am a program director for the Ace3 Africa LC program, which is part of the Ace3 Africa Consortium. That's a consortium that was initiated to support cutting edge genomic research and capacity building on the African continent. And this is the second year that we are doing the uh, H3 Africa, which is the Human Health and Heredity in Africa um, DNA Day presentation. And this is the second and final presentation for DNA Day. DNA Day's official celebration date is April 25th, but the um, National Human Genome Research Institute celebrates it every year from January through May. DNA Day is a global movement to mobilize, energize, and empower communities, educators, and students to innovate, collaborate, and discover the promise of our shared humanity and connection to the natural world. I am very pleased to present Paul Oluniyi um, as our speaker for today. Paul is a computational, uh, computational biologist and PhD research fellow at the African Center for Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Diseases at Redeemers University in Nigeria. His research work focuses on the use of genomics and computational tools to understand the evolution and genetic diversity of pathogens of public health concerns, such as HIV-1, Lassa virus, yellow fever, and SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus in Nigeria and West Africa. His presentation will be on the genomic characterization and surveillance of microbial threats in West Africa. When Paul concludes his presentation, Ali Osgood, a program analyst within the National Human Gen Genome Research Institute will moderate a question and answer session. Please place any questions that you have in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Um, and thank you very much. Um, we'll turn this over to Paul. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Madden, for the introduction. So my name is Paul and I'll be talking about what some of the work we've been doing in the ASVID lab uh, on characterizing and uh, trying to understand microbial outskirts in West Africa. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen now. I hope everyone can see my screen. So, so in, in my presentation, I will talk briefly about uh, how we have used genomic tools to understand uh, Ebola outbreaks in Africa. And also, I will talk about um, some of our work using genomic tools to understand lots of fever outbreaks and yellow fever, and also then end with uh, some of the work we've done on COVID-19 in Nigeria. So uh, as we all know, uh, as uh, probably some of us know, genome sequencing has really revolutionized uh, healthcare and research all around the world. Uh, ever since the Human Genome Project was completed, so many so many discoveries have, have been made as a result of that. I mean, it has led to advancements in personalized medicine, development of, of drugs and vaccines for diseases and, uh, and other, other things like that. But one of the things we have discovered is despite how powerful genome sequencing has been and how much it has changed healthcare and research, a lot of these benefits have still not yet reached Africa or reached African scientists. And so that's one of the reasons why uh, ESGID was, was formed. So ESGID is a, is a consortium based here in the Dimas University Ball, or, uh, together with partners in Nigeria at the, it's at the IST hospital in Edo State, Nigeria, uh, and other hospitals all, all across the country. And together with other partners all across Africa, we have partners in Syria alone, partners in Senegal, in Liberia, and other parts of Africa. And then we also have partners in the US, uh, the Broad Institute, the Harvard, and other institutions across the world. So the, the major aim of ESGID is to uh, create an environment where African researchers can carry out cutting edge genomic research and use this to benefit the health of Africans. And what the, the research arm of the of, of our consortium has been funded by the National Institute of Health and it Africa. Um, the major, what are, one of the things we try to do is we try to characterize fevers of unknown origins using microbial metagenomics. And then we develop uh, diagnostic tools to, to, in order to 
understand, uh, to detect pathogens in real time. Because one of the things we have discovered in not just Nigeria, but all across Africa is a lot of times uh, during an outbreak of a disease, the disease will have spread so much before we even know what is actually causing the outbreak. So one of the things we try to do in this kit is to develop diagnostic kits that can detect uh, pathogens in real time. And then we then use this information to also try to understand uh, human and viral genetics. That is, why are some people more susceptible to a particular disease than some other people? Or why is this particular disease uh, more, more dominant in a particular region of the world, region of the country or region of the continent than other parts? So, like I mentioned earlier, so our goal in ESGID is trying to develop uh, the capacity of African scientists so they can carry out uh, cutting edge genomic research in Africa that can benefit Africans. And so now I'm going to go into uh, some of the practical uh, cases that we have had in ESGID, some, of, some of the ways in which in ESGID we have used genomic tools, cutting edge genomic tools to understand disease outbreaks on the continent. So I'm going to start with the uh, Ebola outbreak of 2014 to 2016. Uh, by, time, uh, by time we had gone months into the 2014 uh, Ebola outbreak in Guinea, uh, we still hadn't yet understand, uh, understood what was actually causing the disease and so many people had been infected and died. It took about almost four months into the outbreak <clears throat> before we actually realized that it was actually the, the outbreak was, in, was being caused by the Ebola virus. But by this time, like I mentioned, the virus had already spread so many people across the country and was already spreading to other parts of Africa. So one of the things we did during, the, during this particular outbreak was to bring together ESGIT partners from all across the world, we brought them together to Redemars Invest in Nigeria. And then we, had, we, we discussed how we can use genomic tools to combat this outbreak. And, and quickly, one of the things we did following this meeting was to start sequencing samples uh, of uh, patients, and then within a few within a few uh, few weeks, we are able to release close to 100 genomes of the virus publicly available before we even release our paper. And then by August 2015, we had already released extra 150 genomes. And this this was this was really useful in uh, making informed public health decisions and also. This also helped us to then develop our diagnostic kits that helped to detect the virus in real time. And one of the things with uh, our uh, genomic surveillance, the uh, helped us understand it during the outbreak in 2014 to 2016 was we were able to understand that there were four different types of the virus that were spreading in Syria alone. And this three just shows you that there was like a single animal to human spillover and the rest of the outbreak was sustained by human to human transmission. So that was one of the things that genomic tools helped us understand. Help us understand that the outbreak has been sustained by people coming in contact with infected people. And there was only like few cases of zoonotic introductions into the population. And this is just, this is a picture showing you, uh, showing the, the typical genome of, of the virus. And one of the things that genomic sequencing helped us understand during the Ebola outbreak was, uh, as the outbreak uh, con continued, the virus began to, uh, acquire mutations all across the gene. And this particular mutation began to confer some particular characteristics of the virus. Not every mutation will be useful, but some of these mutations and then ends up making, helping the virus to become more transmissible and sometimes more deadly. And this is just a map uh, showing how we, how we used the genomes of the virus to understand how the virus was spreading all across Africa in real time during the course of the outbreak. And this is what this, this should this shows, shows the, the, the power of genomics and understanding uh, this these outbreaks are making informed uh, public health responses during outbreaks. So, like I mentioned earlier, following the meeting we had, uh, we quickly sequenced our samples and were able to release close to 100 genomes. And then subsequently, we released extra 150 genomes. Because we are able to understand the genome, the genome, genome of the virus, we are able to then develop uh, rapid diagnostic kits which were few deployable, that is, we could take these kits actually to the, the villages and you know, to the, <clears throat> to the uh, inner regions of Africa so that people didn't have to wait to send their samples to the cities or send their samples to foreign countries before we actually understood what was actually going on. 
while of what was actually causing the disease. And this uh, diagnostic kit was approved by WHO and USFD. And by the time the virus got into Nigeria, because we are already prepared for, for it, because we had armed ourselves with genomic tools, we were able to quickly sequence the first case or the first the index case that got into Nigeria, and then we were able to carry out contact tracing to isolate everyone the, that, that the uh, the industries that come in contact with, and this really helped us to understand the outbreak and helped us to uh, stop the virus from spreading too fast within Nigeria. So within a few weeks, we were able to combat the outbreak in Nigeria because quickly we were able to sequence the virus and we were able to carry out contact tracing, trace everyone the patient that come in contact with, and we were able to make public health decisions that helped uh, to prevent the outbreak from getting out of hand in Nigeria. And, and that, uh, what we've done so far through the years has been understanding lesser fever in Nigeria. Lesser fever is, a, is also a viral hemorrhagic fever and it's very endemic in Nigeria. Every year in Nigeria, we usually have outbreaks of Lassa. And Lassa can be, very, uh, the, the mortality rate of Lassa fever can be quite high. It can be about, about 15 to 60% in some cases. And one, one of the things about Lassa, Lassa fever, it's, it's a very genetically diverse, uh, the virus is very genetic, genetically diverse. And unlike Ebola, that is, uh, um, unlike Ebola, Lassa is primarily transmitted by rodents, although there are also cases of human to human transmission, mostly in hospitals. And so far, we still don't have a, a vaccine yet. And, there are, and previously, there were poor diagnostics and therapeutics for the virus. But one of the things that we have done in, uh, in our lab at ISGID is we have carried out, one of the things we, we did uh, was to carry out sequencing of over 100 patient samples and also rodent samples. And we're able to understand that actually the virus is not a new virus in Nigeria. The virus has been circulating in Nigeria for over a thousand years and then spread out from Nigeria to Ivory Coast about 390 years ago. And this is very, this is very, this, this once again shows you the power of uh, genomic uh, tools. Genomic tools can help you to understand how much a virus is spread in a particular population and how long it has been in the population. And one of the things that our sequencing also helped us to understand was to see the, that there were different clades of the virus, that is different lineages of the virus circulating within Nigeria. So in Nigeria, we have about three different clades of the virus circulating. So that makes it very difficult to develop, uh, that makes it difficult to develop diagnostic kits to actually detect the virus within the country. But one of the things we were able to do as a result of our sequencing work was to then develop diagnostic kits that could capture the diversity of the virus within the country. And in 2018, we had a, we had a particular surge of lesser fever in Nigeria. And the major concern of, uh, of the major concern of scientists and the global public health community was, uh, is this surge caused by new variants of the virus? Uh, we have an increase in increase in human to human transmission. Uh, what, what exactly is causing this increase in cases? So once again, we collected samples from patients. The samples were sent to our lab at his data. We carried out quickly, we carried out in real time genomic sequencing and we were able to uh, obtain the, bio, the, um, the genomes of the virus from different patient samples. And subsequently, we sequenced over 300 letter, full letter of, uh, sequences. And one of the things that this helped us to understand was that there was no particular new strain of the virus circulating in Nigeria. So that was able to calm the fears of the, gov the Nigerian government and also the global public health community that there was, there was no like, new strain of the virus circulating in the country. And our genomic sequencing also helped us to understand that there was no evidence of sustained human to human transmission. So, we were able to see that the virus was still spreading in Nigeria as a result of rodent to human transmission. That is, people were regularly coming in contact with the rodents carrying this virus. And this result was it. So resulting in uh, cases in the country. So, and then one of the things that genomic, uh, genomic sequencing carried in our lab also helped us to understand was the diversity of the virus in Nigeria is structured geographically. That is, we realized that we have different clades of the virus circulating in different regions of the country split by different rivers. So our hypothesis which we uh, put uh, together in our paper, which we published in 2018 was that uh, the rodent population spreading the, this virus to humans couldn't move across these rivers. 
So that's why we have like different clades uh, of the virus in different regions of the continent, differentiated by the, the major rivers. And the interesting thing about this was all of this work was done within the country by Nigerians actually carrying out this sequencing uh, in, in the lab and making and we are making these results available to uh, the, the Ministry of Health of the country and the Nigerian Center for Disease Control in real time. And this helped them to make informed public health decisions. And, and this was very helpful in curbing the outbreak. And th this is this is just like a phylogeographic map showing how the virus has, has spread all over the country all over the country over time. And we're able to generate a map like this using the genomes of the virus. So once again, that shows you the power of genomic sequencing in understanding how our pathogens spread in real time and how they, how they infect people all across uh, different regions in real time. And like I mentioned earlier, we were able to share these results in real time with the uh, with the uh, Ministry of Health and the Health of the Disease Council, and this really helped in making informed public health decisions. And one of the things we've also done through the years uh, has been helping to contain a fever outbreak in the country. Also in 2018, uh, about a cluster of 50 patients reported to one of our partner hospitals in the country. And but the doctors couldn't figure out what was actually causing uh, uh, the, their, uh, their infections. So uh, the doctors carried out malaria tests and typhoid tests. And because the, the particular, this particular region was is endemic for Lassa, they also carried out Lassa fever tests. And these patients were negative. But some, some of them were dying and we still didn't understand what was going on. So samples were sent to our lab at ISGID and we carried out sequen sequencing of, of the samples. We were able to obtain the genomes of the virus. And using the genomes of the virus, we were able to, we were able to and we, first of all, we were able to understand that the, the disease was, the outbreak was being caused by yellow fever virus. We, we, we reported our findings to the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. And this was, this enabled the government to then initiate a yellow fever vaccination program in the country to stop the outbreak before it went so far. And one of the things we also did was to obtain the genomes of the virus, like I mentioned, and then we were able to see that uh, the virus was most likely imported from neighboring West African countries. And also, uh, I haven't talked about that. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to talk about some of the work we've done on COVID-19 in Nigeria. So ever since the outbreak started in Nigeria, our lab has been uh, very involved in carrying out testing, carrying out diagnosis, and also carrying out sequencing to understand how the virus is spreading across the country how people are getting infected, uh, mutations are coming across the genomes of the virus, and to check if the virus is becoming more transmissible or more deadly. So Nigeria reported its first case of COVID-19 on 20th of February, 2020. And this first, this first case, on this index case sample was sent immediately to our lab. And within 48 hours, we were able to release the first African uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome from, from our lab. And this was, this, this has been very useful in, in informing public health response in the, in the country. So just like I mentioned, one of the things we do in, the, in our lab is we carry out diagnosis of uh, COVID-19 spread samples, and then we carry out metagenomic sequencing to, to understand, uh, to, to, to obtain the genome of the virus and then understand how the virus is spreading in real time all across the country. So this is just uh, a chart showing an overview of uh, the process that it takes to receive the sample, the process of the sample, to carry out sequencing and then carry out completion analysis. So this is a map showing uh, the regions of the country in which we are, from which we have obtained genomes so far. So we have obtained genomes so far from over 20 something states of the country. And this really has been useful in understanding uh, how the virus is spreading across the country. So this is it. This is what this image just shows you what we call a phylogenetic tree. So basically, a phylogenetic tree can help you to understand transmission patterns of pathogens in, over time, and also understand changes occurring uh, in genomes of the virus. So one of the things that it is this uh, phylogenetic analysis has helped us to uh, to really understand has been to see how uh, the virus is spreading across the country in real time. Well, I, will, I will give you a particular scenario. There was a particular case where by the time we sequenced 
the samples and built out this, we realized that a, a cluster of sequences, there were, there were particular sequence, there was a particular sequences, about 10 of them, that were clustering very closely together. So our question, so we went back to find out more about the patients. And then we realized that these 10 people were traveling together in the same bus from one state of the country to another state of the country. So they most likely infected one another. So quickly we were, we were able to make these findings available to the um, necessary health authorities and they were able to is isolate this particular patient. So this shows you the power of genomics in, understand, uh, in understanding uh, transmissions of pathogens across uh, space and across time. And one of the things we've also been doing since the beginning of the pandemic in, uh, in Nigeria has been to check for, like I mentioned, mutations occurring across the of the virus. And one particular lineage that, that has been causing the, that has been a major focus of public health response all across the world has been the BU17 lineage, which was I was in the UK. So one one of the things we've been doing in our lab has been monitoring uh, the spread of the lineage of, in the country. So. We detected our first B117 lineage in, in, in Nigeria on the 14th of December 2020. And ever since then, 42% of our, of our genomes have been the B117, showing, showing that, that this particular lineage is now becoming dominant in the country. And one of the things about the B117 lineage is it has been shown to be highly transmissible and to be more deadly. And now we've seen, uh, we've seen this particular lineage in uh, in the uh, capital of the country, Abuja, and Edo State, and Ebony State, and other states of the country. And this is just a three highlighting just the B117 lineage in the country. Uh, and this, this, as, this, helped us, this, this, this really helped us to understand uh, patterns of spread of this particular lineage in the country. And, how, and one of the things we, we realized is. Uh, there, have been, there, have, there has been a lot of spread between countries sharing, sorry, within states in the country that are sharing close borders. So showing that uh, movement of people from one state to another has, has helped this, has made this particular need to spread even faster. And this is just a chart showing uh, the frequency of different uh, lineages of the virus in the country. And as, as you can see from this chart, uh, from this chart the blue one seven lineage of the virus has been particularly dominant ever since we first discovered it in December last year. And this is just a chart showing the spread of uh, the different mutations associated with this particular lineage across the genomes of our, of, of, uh, across the genomes of samples collected in the, in the country. So this video down here is just showing uh, our different lineages of the virus have been spreading all across, all across the country uh, over time. And this has really been useful in helping, helping to inform public health response. Like I mentioned earlier, we report our findings regularly with the Nigeria Staff of Disease Control, and this helps uh, the agency to make uh, different public health decisions. And one of the things we've also been uh, doing in the country in, in our lab has been to check for mutations in, uh, check for primer mutations all across the country. There are different primers used for, that we use to, to carry out diagnosis of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So one of the things we do is to monitor if there are mutations occurring in the, in the regions of the genome where these primers bind to. Because if there are mutations, then these primers might not uh, actually pick the virus. And so we may have, we might be having a lot of false negative cases. And one of the things we've discovered is in some of the primers we've been using, there have actually been mutations occurring in the regions to which they bind the virus. And we we'll realize that this might, this might be, this has been resulting in some, of, some false negative cases in the country. And so since early this year, there was, uh, from late last year to early this year, there was, uh, there has been like a second wave of the virus in Nigeria. And one of the things, we our analysis in our lab has shown is uh, some of this resurgence has been mostly in Lagos State in Abuja and Kaduna State. Lagos State has an international airport and is probably the economic hub of the country. 
and most people coming into the country usually come into the Lagos State. So they could, this could be one of the major reasons why there was a particular surge of, of the virus in Nigeria around December last year to early this year. We realized that most of these people were people coming back into the country during the holiday season and things like that. So one of, uh, one of the things that also been, been a focus of our attention in our lab so far has been a new lineage that was first uh, discovered in patients who had travel history from Nigeria in the UK and, and the US. And this particular lineage called the B155 lineage uh, has been known to have some particular unique mutations. So in our lab, we've, realized, we've discovered that 39% of our genomes, which we have sequenced since we first discovered this in Nigeria, have been the B1525 lineage. So this has, uh, one, of the, one of the things we are currently doing in the lab is to understand if this lineage actually arose in Nigeria or not. So we, we are, so we are currently carrying out some analysis of our genomes to understand if this lineage actually arose in Nigeria or not. So, uh, so to round up my presentation, we now realize that the B117 lineage has, is now the dominant lineage in the country, and we are seeing the emergence of a new lineage called the B155 lineage, which is even spreading just as fast as the B117 lineage. And one of the things we discovered from our analysis is there has been multiple introductions of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in Nigeria from different parts of the world, and we've seen a lot of community transmission of the virus in different states of the country. So I would like to acknowledge all of my colleagues in the ESGID lab, without whom this potential would be possible, and also all our partners and collaborators. And this is just uh, pictures of my colleagues in the lab who have been involved in this work. So thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Paul, for that presentation and for sharing your time and expertise with us. Um, and now we'll jump into questions. So one of the first questions someone asked was, can you compare the emergence of the four Ebola variants to the emergence of the SARS-CoV-2 variants? Um, and they also wondered if the timelines or types of mutations are comparable. Okay, uh, thank, thank you for your question. So, like I, like I mentioned, one of the things that, that uh, uh, viruses and actually RNA viruses are known for is that when they, when, they keep, when they spread from person to person, they acquire mutations. And then these mutations can then, accumulation of these mutations can then result in new variants being formed. So, uh, can I compare the emergence? Yes, you can compare the emergence because they are, because these, these variants are arising as a result of mutations. So the more people are infected, the more variants we'll see occurring in the population. Thank you. Um, another question someone asked was, what actually drives the mutation in primer binding sites in infectious disease pathogens? So yeah, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of factors uh, can drive the mutations. Uh, one of the major factors can be uh, um, human immune response. So when, uh, when these viruses inf infect people in order to thrive within an individual, they acquire mutations so that they can Right. So the more they acquire mutations, some of these mutations will occur in the region in which this primers bind to. And then when we then use this virus, this, this particular primers to carry a diagnosis, we can then have cases of uh, false negatives. So what drives the mutations? Is that we, so the more people these viruses infect, uh, the more they acquire mutations in order to survive. And then the more we would see mutations in primer binding sites. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in your presentation, you mentioned a couple times that through this work, you've been able to provide real time um, results to uh, public health authorities. And someone was wondering how the ministry and other authorities communicate um, the risks of Lhasa and Ebola to communities. 
Yeah, so I think one of the things that the, that the government has, has been doing has been to uh, create jingles, create, uh, uh, try to create videos in different languages that people speak across the country. And then one of the things the government has also done is to actually go into these communities uh, talk to people who are who are well respected in these communities, maybe like the head of the community, like uh, talk to people who are well respected, who would then pass the information across to the members of the community. And this has really been very, very helpful in you know passing information across about different diseases. And one of the things that the government has also done is using social media, which has also been very powerful in spreading uh, the news about these uh, pathogens and, uh, and why people should take precautions and things like that. Thank you. So it sounds like making the information accessible to communities is really important. Um, someone asked, what are some of the challenges to employing genomic surveillance techniques in communities? Yeah, so, uh, so one of the challenges that we've been facing, for instance, uh, in our lab, for instance, has been some of these genomic sequencing tools can be quite expensive. And so sometimes you need uh, to secure funding to be able to like actually uh, acquire them and then make use of them. And sometimes in this part in Nigeria and other parts of Africa, some, some of these funding are usually not readily available. And also, some, also expertise also matters. There are, not people, there are not many people in this region of the world who are actually skilled in using some of this uh, equipment and tools. So it's always important to carry out. So, so, so it has been really useful. It has been really like important to carry out trainings and constantly train many more African scientists to be able to use this tool. So one of the challenges we are having has been funding and also lack of expertise using some of these tools. Thank you. Um, and what are some of the tools in the lab that support the next generation sequencing that you use to analyze the data? Okay, so like I mentioned, so once you carry out sequencing, one of the things we do is uh, we use different bioinformatic pipelines to uh, assemble. You know, so one of the tools we use, we use our VARA NGS pipeline which is developed by collaborators at the Brown Institute. We use this pipeline to assemble our viral genomes. And then we then use other softwares like NextStrain to uh, build for genetic trees. And then we use uh, softwares like Pangolin and um, NextClade to understand the different lineages and clades of the virus spreading in the country over time. Thank you. Um, and a little bit ago, you mentioned the importance of uh, training and education opportunities in Africa. Uh, could you speak a little bit more about your training path um, within H3 Africa and the, your path to the position that you're currently in? Yes, yeah, so uh, since I joined the, uh, the it's good lab and I've been part of the H3 Africa project, uh, one of the uh, interesting things about it, Africa is it Africa is very like particular about training African scientists. So uh, I've been privileged to attend a lot of uh, Africa like trainings uh, and webinars, and also my lab, uh, uh, the the Esgid lab also, also has uh, supported me to attend a lot of like um, to attend like internships and trainings uh, abroad in the US and in the UK, and this has helped me personally as uh, an Institute Africa PhD fellow to uh, acquire like skills and expertise uh, to, uh, to, to be able to use some of these genomic tools to uh, understand disease outbreaks in the country. Thank you for sharing. Um, someone was wondering, do you think the relatively low COVID-19 um, rates in Nigeria and in Africa compared to Western countries um, is due to genetic or environmental factors. And could you discuss the environmental factors? Yeah, so, 
I mean, one of the things uh, we are currently like, some, some of the research going on right now is trying to understand uh, the gene genetic reasons for some of some of these, uh, some of the low, uh, like I said, low cases we've been, we've been having in African countries. But, but one of the things uh, I, might, I might say is some of the, some of the low cases we have might not necessarily be because we're not because the virus is not spreading in the country, but maybe because we are not carrying out enough tests. When we see uh, the amount of testing going on in Nigeria, for instance, compared to uh, in other like non-African countries, we realize that there's a like very big gap. So we are not actually carrying out enough tests within the country. So we can't really say we have low amount of cases. But also we, we can also rely on the fact that obviously there can be like other environmental factors. But that is still something that we are trying to like understand better. Uh, uh, maybe our exposure to like maybe like previous pathogens could be confirming confining resistance and things like that. But that is something that we are still trying to better understand. So no, I can explain. Thank you. Uh, let me see what the next question was. Someone asked if you have considered using newer portable sequencers. Um, and they also wondered if you faced any challenges in terms of biologic and bioinformatic equipment accessibility. Well, yes. Yeah, so in our, in our lab, yes, yeah, so we've been using like uh, newer portable sequencers like the Oxford Nanopore, we've been using the uh, uh, Illuminati ISIC 100. So yeah, so we, we've been using uh, newer sequences to try to like generate sequences in real time. So we don't just use like the my six and the high six and newer six. We also actually use like the smaller sequences and that's one to obtain more sequences. And are we face any challenges in terms of uh, biologic and bioinformatic accessibility? So one of the, one of the major challenges we've been facing in terms of uh, has been available. So, supply and reagent chain. So sometimes when we order for like reagents to carry out sequencing, uh, because of so many logistical issues, sometimes it takes weeks and even months for this reagent to, to arrive in the lab. And this can actually, this sometimes slows down the work we do in our lab. So yes, we've been having a lot of like logistic challenges, like uh, supply chain issues with customs when the, even when the reagents arrive in the country. And this sometimes, have, uh, slows down our work. But in terms of bioinformatics accessibility, uh, the major issue we've been having on that area has been, the major issue has been bandwidth and internet issues. Uh, sometimes internet connection uh, is always like a big challenge for us generally. And so that sometimes affects, uh, it slows down some of our analysis work and affecting all the uh, computational work we do in the lab. Let's see. Thank you for sharing. Uh, someone wondered if you could describe patient privacy protections that are in place in Nigeria or in other African countries um, for genomic surveillance. And is it a challenge to build trust in communities? Yes. So, uh, so in, in, our, in, in our lab, for instance, one of the things we, we've done through the years in order to build trust has been, uh, we actually go into these communities and try to uh, let them understand the, the relevance of our work. We didn't just come in and collect the sample. We actually try to like uh, also develop the communities. So for instance, if we are going to work in a particular community, we would try to, because of the funding we received, you know, from the East Africa, from the World Bank and several other organizations, we try to actually develop like uh, maybe clinics in this community so that we are actually benefiting the community as we are also working there. So it's not just about coming there, collecting the samples, we actually also benefit the community. And when it comes to patient privacy, we, we make sure we, we make sure that we do not, uh, our patients know that we do, we do not release any private information. So we, we make sure that, all our studies before we carry them out uh, goes to rigorous ethical eth ethical uh, uh, considerations before we even carry them out. And we make sure we take our time to protect patient privacy. So we're very particular about that. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that's really important. 
Um, looks like someone said that they are a pharmacist in Nigeria and they are interested in the surveillance of infectious diseases. What opportunities would this person have um, from ACEGID or H3 Africa in terms of scholarships? Yes, so thank you. So yeah, so uh, like I mentioned, one of the things, one of the major focuses of ASGID and also H3 Africa conversation as a whole is to build the capacity of uh, African science. This is one of, the, one of the ways that uh, is good and H2 Africa does this is by training masters and PhD students. So yeah, in is good and I'm sure even the H2 Africa as a whole, there are lots of scholarships for like masters and PhD students. So, so if you're interested, you, you can check out the ASGID website and I'm sure you will find like how to apply and you'll find like opportunities for uh, scholarships in the lab and uh, in the lab. So, so we have a lot of opportunities for masters and PhD students. Thank you. Um, and do you have any advice for young scientists who are interested in being part of this field? Yes. So uh, my, my, my advice would, would be to make use of uh, you know, the opportunities that are available. Like I mentioned, there, there are several opportunities available through to Africa. It's Africa regularly organizes several trainings, several webinars on bioinformatics, on molecular biology and genomics. So, and some of these resources are, are usually shared on social media. Um, so, so make use of all the opportunities you have. And like I mentioned, uh, even uh, ESGID is constantly like accepting masters and PhD students. So you can check out the website esgid.org and you can see how to, to apply. And uh, also reach out, you can reach out to, if you see anybody in the field who, who's working and interested in, reach out to them. Now social media has made it very, very easy to access people. So send DMs, send personal messages, send emails, reach out to people and you realize that more people are willing to help than you think. Thank you. I mean, it looks like someone has a question about data sharing they wondered, how do you ensure that the data generated is shared amongst other labs across the continent? And how do you ensure that that data is secure? Okay, yeah. So one of the things, like I mentioned, whenever we are uh, doing these outbreaks, um, every time we create genome, genome sequence in the lab, one of the things we do is to make sure we release uh, data in real time. So this can help to inform uh, public health response. So we released, we released uh, our genome sequences on DSAID and NCBI. We make them available on Virological so that people all, ac all across the country and all across the world can see them. And one of the things we also do is we make sure that we do not release any private patient data. So we only release genome sequences of pathogens of interest, but we, do not, we make sure we do not uh, release any uh, private patient data. And so basically, and, and then we make sure we, we share uh, our inferences and results with, uh, like I mentioned, the NCDC, which is Nigerian Staff of Disease Control, and other health authorities in the country, so they can, they can help to inform their public health responses. And like, like I mentioned, we also make use, of, make use of social media. And then, because we have a lot of partner hospitals across the country, and so these are some of these some of our partner hospitals are located actually in the rural areas in the country. So we we have we have people that we have trained who we'll go out into these communities, and then we we'll, we'll make our findings available to uh, people in these communities and breaks it down to them in ways they will understand. And also, some of the people we train also understand the language languages spoken in these communities, so they can actually communicate to them in their own language and make them understand our uh, findings. And that way we make, we make sure that the information we get from the lab is actually available for everyone. Um, and there, are there any other ways that you or health authorities ensure that 
scientific data is communicated in more rural areas? So I didn't get a question. So I didn't get a question. Oh, I'll repeat it. Um, someone wondered, how do you ensure your scientific data is communicated in the rural areas? So I think you touched on that a little, but we would love to hear more. Okay. So like I mentioned, uh, we train people who understand the languages spoken in these communities. And then these people go into the communities and talk to like people in the community and make them understand our findings. One of the things we also do is whenever we go into the community, we try to meet with uh, the heads of the communities. Like uh, if there's a king in the community or there's a chief, like we meet with the heads or any people who are well respected within that community and then talk to them and they then help us to pass this information across. And one of the things we also do is, uh, like I mentioned earlier, to create videos, create jingles, uh, in very interactive like uh, media uh, information so that people can actually watch and this can really help them to understand what we do in the lab and break it down to them in a way they would understand. Thank you. And someone said, you mentioned that social media is being used to communicate with communities. Do you think that the mobile health approach is making a difference? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Especially in Nigeria, I think it's actually making a huge difference. I think, I think it's it's making people more receptive to scientific findings, and it's also making people really underst understand better uh, what scientists and doctors and health officials actually do. So I think, yeah, I think it's making a difference. That's awesome to hear. Uh, someone also said, you mentioned precision medicine. How do you ensure that this becomes um, democratizing in a country of almost 200 million with over 300 or so ethnic groups? Yes, so I mean, this is something that uh, we are constantly working with uh, different, you know, organizations, uh, diff working with the government, working with different partners to make sure that this is achieved in the country. So we have a long way to go in Nigeria and Africa as well when it comes to like precision medicine and uh, making this, uh, democratizing this, but this is something that we are constantly working on. This is something that we constantly meet with people on the ground just to see how we can uh, make this equitable and accessible across the country. So this is something we are, something we are, like, we are constantly working on. Thank you for answering that. Um, someone wondered, how is your research supported beyond H3 Africa and other international funding sources? Um, has the government invested in genomics? Uh, so, so far, one of the major challenges we've been having in Nigeria has been that government has not been too willing to invest in genomic research. So, our lab, we are majorly funded by Africa, NIH, uh, the World Bank, the uh, UK. So, so we are majorly funded right now by international organizations um, uh, like the, the Odysseus Project. Uh, yeah, uh, so we are majorly funded by international organizations right now. But one of the things we are also trying to do is to keep convinced, trying to convince the government to invest in genomic research. But so far, like I mentioned, the government has not been too willing, but we're hoping that will change in a couple of years or in the next future. Thank you. Um, do you think COVID-19 and addressing this outbreak has changed um, public perception of genomic characterization and surveillance at all? Yeah, yeah, I, th I think so. I think uh, during COVID, especially, we have been very aggressive in uh, in reaching out to people, especially to non-scientists. So I think uh, that has this has really like 
helped people to better understand what we actually do because before people just a lot of people just don't know how don't don't understand how genomics actually contributes to their health or how it affects them personally. But I think some of the work we've done during the during this pandemic, like aggressively actually going out, creating uh, social media awareness, you know, uh, meeting talking to people in the community, really in rural areas, I think that, that actually changed people's perspective and it has made people more open and more uh, understanding of genomics and how it helps them stay healthy. So yeah, I think it was, I think the pandemic has helped us in that area. And then someone was wondering if there are opportunities for undergraduate students as well. And so at the Mass University right now, yes, yeah, so there are opportunities for undergraduate students and to be uh, involved in genomic research going in his gate. So uh, because our lab is based within the university, so we also support undergraduate students. So yes, there are opportunities for undergraduate students. Um, and then could you describe some of the major challenges uh, you faced conducting genomics research in Nigeria and on the African continent? Yes, so I think one of our major uh, challenges, and I think I mentioned this earlier, has been funding. Like somebody asked the question, most of our funding has been coming from international organizations. So we haven't really, the government hasn't really like funded much of the work we do. So I think that's, that has been a major challenge, getting the government to really fund the work we do. Also, another major challenge we've been having has been uh, supply chain for the agents. I mean, like I said, like I mentioned during my presentation, sometimes when we order for agents, it sometimes takes months before they get to the lab. And this is a lot of a lot of different like factors, and so this also can really slow down research work. So, I mean, imagine wanting to carry out sequencing, and the sequencing agent is taking months to arrive in the lab. This is months that we could have used to, you know, obtain like several genomes. And so, so yeah, uh, so supply chain has been a major challenge also, and. Another uh, major challenge, which, which I think uh, the awareness we've been creating during the COVID pandemic has helped in alleviating a bit, has been uh, initially people just don't understand how genomics benefit them, what exactly contributes to, to their lives. So they have to understand how our research work is relevant to them. But I think uh, it has also been like a major challenge. But I think one of the things we've been uh, during, the, during the outbreak, you know, communicating to people aggressively, which, which not, aggressively reaching out to people, I think that also helped. I think that, that helped a little bit of challenge a bit. But I think our major challenges have been funding and then supply chain. Sometimes even when the agents arrive in the country, you know, you still have to go through a lot of like customs issues and things like that. So that affects research work a lot. Thank you for sharing. And I think this might be our last question. Um, what have you found, or what things have you found to be the most rewarding um, about this work that you are doing? Yeah, I think uh, the most rewarding has been just knowing that uh, the work I do in the lab, the work that my colleagues and I do in the lab is actually you know, saving people's lives. I mean, like when we make our findings available to health authorities, it actually helps them make informed public health decisions. I think that has really been very feeling personally for me and I think for all my colleagues in the lab. I think knowing that what we are doing is actually directly affecting the lives of people, making people's lives better, helping people to uh, to survive, to live, you know, healthier lives. So I think, I think that has been very fulfilling, personally for me, and I'm sure for all my colleagues in the lab. Sorry, I was muted. Definitely. Um, and I think 
with that, thank you so much for sharing this important work that you are doing. Thank you to all of our attendees um, for coming and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day or afternoon or evening, depending on where in the world you are. Uh, and thank you again, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ali. Thank you, everyone. So